Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the top five values of promoting cultural competence in the workplace. And we have a special guest. So our special guest is Megan Lewis. Hello, my name is Glenn Geitzen, your cultural competency navigator, keynote speaker, and diversity and inclusion in the workplace trainer. My goal is to deliver practical solutions to organizations seeking to reap the proven benefits of diverse, inclusive, and culturally competent teams. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the top five values of promoting cultural competence in the workplace. And we have a special guest. So our special guest is Megan Lewis. Uh, Megan has been in the utility and training development industry for 15 years. Megan, you don't even look like uh, you've been working that long. Uh, she, <laughs> she currently serves as a diversity, equity, and inclusion manager, driving strategy for the organization to create an environment of inclusion, respect, and equity. She is passionate about career development, leaning into strengths while developing, new, helping people to develop new skills, and loves an opportunity to lead interactive teams. She has a bachelor's in mass communications. Maybe I need some of that help right now as we get started. But she has a bachelor's in mass communications from California State University East Bay and a master's in business administration from St. Mary's College of California. So you are a California girl, I see. Yes. Uh, when she is away from work, you can find her on the trails hiking with her adorable English bulldog, Abby. All right. Hey, Megan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Glenn. Hey, it is a pleasure. Uh, Megan and I uh, met probably, I don't know, three, has it been three years, Megan, that we yeah, met? Yeah, two or three years. Yeah. And so uh, Megan is one of my, my my best clients, one of my favorite clients, but I really love working with, with her organization and uh, just the depth of knowledge uh, that her team has. Uh, their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion is really why I wanted her to be one of uh, our our guests. And and so I think that Megan's going to give us a lot of insight. Uh, so if you are an HR professional doing this work, that's what Megan does. And I think her team does it really well. I always like learning new things from 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 my clients. So uh, Megan, again, thank you so much for, for being here. So I just have a couple of questions uh, for you to get us started. And my first question is, like, how did you get into this HR field and, and why are you passionate about DEI work? Yeah, good question. Um, I honestly really just tripped and fell into HR. I was working for a mortgage company and the 2008 bubble popped. Um, oh, wow. And I appreciate the age reference because, yes, I was old enough to work then as well. Um, and so kind of just looked around and ended up at a utility. Um, and I was in the training development space, started kind of answering phones, really. They were going through a big training um, initiative change okay. and then grew with that company. Um, and it really became my passion. You know, I was doing a lot of logistics, but was reading all the materials that I was learning. And so it really grounded me very early mm -hmm. in learning um, leadership skills, career development and relationship development. Um, and then kind of fast forward another 10 years, if you can believe it, um, I was really looking for my next biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. I had been at the, co the new company for a while. I was ready for my next challenge. And then my boss did just that. She handed me the start of the DE&I program and asked me to make the rest. Um, and then six months into that, really um, the country changed, right? This was 2020, when we yeah. experienced social change and unrest that moved DEI from what was a platform or part of our company, what we did as a foundation, to more of an imperative of what our company does. Um, and I would say that I'm passionate about DEI work because I see the impact it has on employees, I see the impact it has on um, my colleagues and and how much more successful they are because of our focus on DE and I. Yeah, I mean that's interesting. So you started <clears throat> with some of this in 2008, and I think that really how we do it now has changed. And I, I started 
Megan with anti-racism training back in the 90s. So I guess it wasn't even popular then. Uh, but you mentioned how the world changed uh, really in significant ways. I think that the disruption in the workplace is, is, um, is what I see happening, right? And I'm glad you focused on some of these positive impacts, uh, aspects of this work about changing relationships, a better, better culture. I think those, those are critical things that we need to pay attention to ongoing. But yeah, in 2019, 2020, we had major disruption where it was almost impossible uh, to work on the positive aspects of DEI. We were just so much just dealing with the chaos and the fallout for companies that were were behind. And, I, and I'm so glad that your organization was, I mean, you all seem to be on the, on, on the, on the cutting edge of this uh, as I compare other groups that I work, work with. Yeah, I, you know, I think every company is in a different place. I think every company approaches it differently. I can speak for my company. I stand behind how we approached it. We had already had some work underway in DEI, mm -hmm. um, and it was woven in our, our values. And when you think about company cultures, most companies have a value or a mission statement. But yeah. is it is it just words on a paper, words on a poster, or is it something that people are living? And I think, you know, I'll probably you'll probably hear me say this multiple times, but that matters so much um, to the disruption of and, and the success that we had was because of our value system. And it wasn't just words on a paper. It was something we lived in. DE and I was really grounded in that. Well, that's good. And, and, I, and I can sense that again, you know, I, I have pretty diverse client client base. Uh, but I can sense where, when it's not really not a priority in organizations, uh, or when it's really not tied to something else, it's kind of like, hey, we're just going, hey, can you come do diversity training? But you had some specific goals, some, some some specific skills that I know you all wanted to, to, uh, you know, pass on to your teams, and and for the most part, I think people were really on board. They were really open to the. The uh, training, maybe it's my my charm, I don't know, uh, but people were really engaged. But what do you do with people that may be resistant? Like they just think this is not necessary. Yeah, um, it's really about getting to know the person and why. Um, at least that's my approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I come at you and say, "Look, you need to do this, and you need to do this now." you're not going to like it. But yeah. if I get to know you and what your hesitations are or what your priorities are and your challenges and successes, I can build on that and meet you where you're at and say, you know, here's, here's where I think you could go or give them the benefit and the value. And everybody is different, especially in the DE&I journey. When mm -hmm. I'm talking to people, I try to give them the business case for DE&I in different places. I talk about it from a head perspective of, you know, as a leader, if you know your people, you're going to get better results out of them. I talk about it from a heart perspective of my own personal journeys and how I want to make the better, the world better for my nephew so that he doesn't have as many challenges in the world. Right. Okay. So if you talk about it from different angles and you really just get to know the person, why they're resistant and meet them where they're at versus saying you're here. I need you over here. You're already creating a wall that is going to be harder to bridge. And that goes against what DE&I is for me. DE&I is really us understanding each other and learning and growing together, not tearing us apart. I, I like that. I, I love that. You should uh, you should take that on the road. I mean, I, I think some people, you know, some people do say that. Oh, this is just tearing us apart. If we talk about this, is we're creating divisions division but it's but it, it really isn't that i'm so glad that's this is why i like working with you i'm so <laughs> glad you get that right but that's why i have so much fun with your 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 company and and i and i think there i mean we'll talk about the tangible things the takeaways but but part of what you said was you, we have to meet people where they are exactly yeah. that's what we need to do anytime we have a shift in culture anytime we want to change behavior anytime you're trying to educate people you have to meet people where they are. That's just that's just basics of, of, of teaching, of training. Right. Find out where your learner is and then what skills do you want them to have? And then what is their pathway to getting there? One size does not fit all in diversity inclusion. Uh, 
we have different perspectives, right? That's that's the heart of this. Uh, is diversity? It's not sameness. It's so. How do we uh, meet the needs of people? How do we educate them and bring them along? And some of it's you know head knowledge that we that we want to give them, like you said, and then some of it's heart heart knowledge. I mean, I always encourage personal stories so these things connect with people. Um, you got to make it real. Uh, you said uh, earlier about words on a page. It can't just be, some people like words on a page. I think one of the things that you you warned me about when I was working with your group, group you have you have some fairly uh, educated people with scientific minds, right? And so I had to I, I had to adapt my training to them so it was kind of more of, of a formula, but that didn't mean I didn't include personal stories in it. And, and so it's part of it. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, there are a number of different trainers and training styles, uh, but it's important that we consider the learner, right? That in, in all of this, and that's this. This is all this is about. It's about education to to change behavior to, to allow us to work um, better to, together. So I, I really appreciate what what you shared. Um, so I know you worked with a, a number of people, a number of different uh, DE and I professionals. Um, yeah what, yeah, what do you think people get wrong? I mean, you, you, you've touched on this a little bit. What do you think people get wrong when they're doing this training? Right. I mean, it's kind of the opposite of what I just said is that approach, right? If you're forcing it, um, you're separating people, um, that's the wrong way to do it. You know, when we started our training way before the social unrest, mm -hmm. I gave training and all the feedback I got was, that's not enough. We need more. Mm -hmm. And that's where I wanted to be this whole time is I would give another training and the feedback was, that's not enough. We need more. All right. And I wanted to stay in that spot because as soon as I got in the spot of, Hey, this is too much. We're done. I've, I've turned off the learner. Right. Yeah. So I always wanted to leave them with more room for growth and not okay. give them that full picture so they could continue engaging in that journey. Um, so again, that approach of, you know, forcing or going too hard and not uh, really knowing where your people are at, I think it's incredibly important to understand the culture of the organization and where okay. you're at. You know, I'm doing DE&I in the South and I'm very recognizing that that's in the South and the culture in the South is completely different than the culture in the West. And you have to understand the culture that you're working in, meet them where they're at. If you are ignoring the culture and you are ignoring where people are at and you're just saying, this is what we're doing, you're not allowing for them to have that buy-in and really go on this change curve with you. So that kind of plays into change management, which is kind of also a piece of this as well. Yeah, I think it, I think it, it really is uh, change management. And you mentioned... Um, you know, like, yeah, knowing where you are, knowing the culture, knowing the regions that, you, that you're that you in. Uh, teaching this in the South is is probably, yeah, different than and maybe if I was in, 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 in Boston, right? I have to pick on Boston if I have anybody from Boston there. But, you know, it's a different, it's a different culture, right? A different environment, you know, even New York City, you know, they're, they're, they're different. And I actually use that in some of my training, but it's just a different feel and maybe even a different awareness. Um, I don't know if the South is more receptive. Maybe maybe it's more receptive. I mean, it's a... And it doesn't always have to be a bad thing, right? So yeah. in Alabama, if you talk about Roll Tide, I mean, you're in and you, you've got that you've got that audience, right? In California, you don't necessarily have to talk about sports to right. get the audience engaged. And so it's, if you understand the people, you're going to be able to create that buy-in. It's about relationships. That's what DE&I is about. It's about relationships. So you need to start there versus starting from a place of somebody's doing something wrong. Let's just all learn together. Yeah. Well, Megan, I have to disagree with you on something. Now, if we say road tap, <laughs> you are doing something wrong, right? Uh, Texas <laughs> is coming to fix the SEC. So that's that's one thing that we can have confidence in. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to have disagreements. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Well, okay. So uh, part of what I want to share with uh, people as we talk about this, 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 uh, this, this this subject, you know, what are the values? Why do people uh, have, you know, talk about cultural competency? Why do we work at uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in, in the workplace? And so I kind of list five things. Uh, and if you follow my blog, you all can, can uh, I'll put that link in the description. You all can uh, look at the five 
values that I see when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, but I'll just go through them really quickly. Uh, number one, better team and organizational performance. Number two, you get tangible uh, results for your investment. Uh, number three, flexible systems and skills. Number four, one of my favorites, more harmonious teams. And number five, enhanced communication and leadership capacity. So, so Megan, uh, as we as you think about the list, uh, what would you add, or you know, what do you think about those top five values? I think those values are really right on. Um, I learned best with those tangible examples, right? So for better team and organizational performance, how does that look like? What does that look like in day-to-day -day interactions with your work? For me, you know, I found out an employee had a disability, hidden disability, and um, we had a really good conversation around it. And I now work with him differently because of it. I am accommodating him. I'm understanding of what his needs are, and I give that to him. And because of that better team environment that we've created, mm -hmm. we're having better results um, as it relates to that. So I see one and two really coming together, but I like the tangible example of how this can impact the, the, the organization um, and, and where we've seen that. I love the idea of flexible systems and skills. I use that all the time in my organizations. So you want them standardized so it's repeatable and you can have those process yeah. efficiencies, but it needs to be flexible for the needs of the organizations. Um, we have a bunch of employee resource groups and they have different needs. So we need flexible structures, but yeah. we want to maintain similar standards. Um, so we're really still being efficient, um, meeting the organization's needs, but also meeting each employee resource group's needs. So that flexibility is key. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important. And so, so we talk about our systems. You, you want it, you want it to be standardized, and you said, and flexible, but to meet the needs of the organization. And I think that's key. And I, and I always tell people the work that I'm doing is uh, for the organization. You know, I'm working at diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace. We want to have culturally competent organizations. And so, I know there's a fear in some some sectors uh, of the world where people are, oh, you know. We're going woke. We're going to we're going to destroy the company. Well, that's because you don't know what you're doing, right? You're doing it wrong, right? You're you're not yeah, looking wrong. at this the right <laughs> way. Like, who wouldn't want the best qualified people? Who wouldn't want a a larger uh, employee pool? Who wouldn't want uh, people with different perspectives? So I, I think companies that said, oh, well, and, and they're probably not listening to this list. So maybe <laughs> I'm speaking to the choir, right? They're not listening to Glenn's, <laughs> Glenn's podcast, but. I think that's the misconception is that if you have uh, a good diversity, equity, and inclusion program, somehow you're compromising on your standards. But that that's not the case. You're mm -hmm. really enhancing your work. You're you're you can respond to change more effectively than a company that's rigid or that's monolithic. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's an important piece. And then uh, let me go back to when you were talking about your your colleague. Uh, sometimes we really narrowly focus, and this is why I like cultural competency and why I talk, talk about it, because I think we need to have the skill where we can work across a number of differences. It's not just about gender, race, or or, or some of these big things that we talk, talk through. We need to be able to communicate with people that don't think like us, that are from re that from different regions than, than us. We, we need to know how to ask questions, how to resolve conflicts. And how to handle all kinds of diversity. So, to me, that's that's the important piece of this 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 work. And I think, like you said, it goes along with this better team and organizational feedback. Uh, I've worked with some teams where I had too many uh, millennials at the time uh, on a team. It just didn't function well because everyone had the same bias as far as right. the information we were trying to communicate. So I had to get some older people on the team. That didn't mean I, I didn't want any millennials. No, I just needed some different perspectives on the team because the audience I was communicating with was age diverse. So I couldn't just have 34 year olds communicating everything. I needed some 40 year olds. I needed some 50 year olds on, on the team. So, Us millennials have gotten a bad rap, just like DE and I. So <laughs> we're going to have to fix that next. <laughs> yeah, well, I tell everybody that the millennials are getting old, right? Uh, some of y'all are in, in your 40s now. So, uh, you know, now we have to worry about Gen Z. 
The, the interesting <laughs> thing about that, this is kind of a side note, is that, you know, millennials just went through the same age progression as everybody else. You know, young people are always unfocused, always trying to change the world, and the old people are trying to say, hey, stop moving my stuff, get off my lawn, you crazy kids. <laughs> it's always the same thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> the only thing is, the, only, the best generation, of course, was Gen X. It wasn't many of us. Uh, but you know, we were a tough generation. But you know, but every generation says that, right? Oh, we were tough back in our day. It was so hard. So uh, I don't know if the millennials is a tough generation or not. Yeah. Though <laughs> <laughs> you know, Megan, I feel like y'all been through some stuff, though, right? Like the the housing crash, the uh, COVID. Uh, like it's like I like young people have been through so much stuff. Now you you all may not like desensitized to how much we've been through. Yes, it's, it's amazing. So I think, so for my older listeners, please pay attention to that. Uh, be be empathetic to the needs of our, our, our younger generations because they've been through a lot of stuff. It's so weird, I think, for for millennials and, and even as the next generation of Gen Z's come along. It's just, it's, it's kind of traumatic. So yeah, so I kind of tip my hat to you all. Well, <laughs> <laughs> all right let's all right so do you think your work is making a, a difference which is is it really making a difference or is this just some part of a, a woke agenda or some <laughs> other kind of agenda is is it really making a difference megan it is it is so you know what we're focused on right now is really the culture at the company that we create and it's got a foundation in our values and our leadership competencies Mm -hmm. So the strategy that we've focused on that kind of culture, that work environment we created is through grassroots teams. So we have 13 different grassroots teams. They're focused on different stuff, but they've been leading regular programming to further our education on DEI, really starting back in 2017, the, the team started. Okay. Um, and so it's provided an avenue that has built relationships among the peers um, and we're hearing that the events are helping employees understand history they had no idea about. Um, it's helped bridge the gap between perception and narrative, right? So we've got this perception that DE and I, you go woke, you go broke, right? You've got that yeah. perception. But yeah. what the reality is, is it's building these relationships. People are understanding the, uh, their colleagues' real stories, and it's resulting in deep dialogue and connection. Mm -hmm. um, we're also hearing that these grassroots teams are in, impacting new employees into the organization. So you're new into the organization. It takes a while to kind of build those relationships, feel comfortable and feel like you're up to speed. We're seeing that that's happening so much faster as a result of our DE and I work. Yeah. So you, you're really fostering that sense of belonging. And I know that that can be some, you know, a kind of foo-foo word people don't like but i mean it really means something is you if you connect it to what it means to be included like people know where they belong in the organization they have a sense that they're contributing to the organization and uh yeah i've, I've worked with some of your employee action teams and uh participated in some of their their celebrations and got to see some of the good work that they're doing both in the company and, and uh outside of the company that community engagement is a is a part of it um and I don't think, so you mentioned history, and so I don't know if this, I know I taught something about the history of employee resource groups in one of my presentations, but this whole thing about, yeah, you go you go woke, you, you go broke, is kind of crazy because businesses actually started a lot of these initiatives. Um, you know, I talk about the first employee resource source group. You know, it started in response to uh, a societal event. So, you know, IBM was, was instrumental in starting some of these things. And so companies have often responded to things going on in society because they knew eventually it would impact their business case. And, right. and so, yeah, what, what company is, should I, can I say dumb? Yeah. What companies are dumb enough to think <laughs> what's going on in society is not going to impact how they do business and that they have to put systems and policies in, in place to respond to these things. I, I think that folks are just missing, they, they don't know history maybe, maybe they're just missing something. And again, I mean, I'm gonna, I've got, you know, a few soapboxes and you're gonna hear it again. It's the approach, it's the way you go about it. 
and yeah. being able to have this focus on culture and your people, why wouldn't you want to be focused on your people um, is going to provide so much value mm -hmm. versus reacting to what's happening outside the company. And again, the misconceptions that there is about this focus on DEI. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. And, and I tell people all the time, I said, Hey, you know, I'm not telling you, you have to adopt these, these principles. I said, you can be, as discriminatory as you want in your organization. If you feel like that's a good business model for you to cut out, you know, 50%, 25% of the population, if you feel like you can do well that way, hey, that's that's on you. Uh, but I think that um, being more inclusive, being, you know, being diverse uh, really helps. And there's some, some organizations where, you know, you're intentionally discriminatory, maybe because of some social economic reason, right? You know, you have high price points, low pr price points, but even within that price point discrimination, there are all kinds of people within that bubble. And so yeah. I think we have to be mindful that even if we have a segmented uh, consumer group, there's still some diversity even within that. Absolutely. Yeah. So now do you have, do you all do much work with data to back up your, your viewpoint to gauge your success in this? Yeah, I mean, the company I work for, we're all about data, right? And yeah. I, you know, I don't imagine any company that ha doesn't have a good business model isn't about data. Um, I'll say representation for all of our mini minority groups across all levels. So whether you're an individual contributor or leader, every single level um, has increased. Um, and then our leadership programs are also reflecting this. Mm -hmm. So we have a high potential leadership program and 68% of them this year are minorities and females. But for me, again, you know, I know we love data. I know we like to see, you know, those numbers. Yeah. But for me, it's more than representation. It's seeing the impact that we're having on a regular basis. Yeah. We had that leadership program come together um, for a reunion and they were able to make connections between our leadership competencies and how innovation, one of our company's focus is gonna come as a result of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So yeah. I think as we talk about DE&I being woven in our culture and, and not being an add-on program, right. making the connection between different business importances, you know, leadership, innovation, diversity, equity, inclusion, they're not three separate competencies, they're woven together. And so they're making those connections. Um, and then I, I can tell you that we're hearing success stories on a regular basis. And so, you know, I could try and put a number on it, you know, every meeting I'm hearing, you know, five success stories, but I can tell you, you know, the themes we're hearing are changing. Mm -hmm. The amount of success stories we're hearing is, is increasing. Last year, you know, I did meetings with leaders and I probably get one or two people who spoke up at the end. This year, it's already five and people are clamoring over each other to share their success stories. So I know that's not a number, but we're seeing that difference of those stories. And that's been incredible. Yeah, no, I, I think that's important. I mean, and you can gauge some things. I, I like data, but sometimes we can get crippled by data. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a balance, I think, uh, for us to... You know, it's, it's not all about the analytics. You do need some analytics. I mean, because, you know, you want to, you're accountable to your stakeholders and you, performance and all that good stuff. But but that cultural aspect, sometimes people can just see it, sense it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I know right away, you know, there are some chains or brands that I say, OK, hey, hey, if I go to this hotel chain, if I go to this restaurant, I know I'm going to get quality service, top not 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 service. I'm going to to be satisfied. I probably won't even write a, a review for that. But if I go somewhere and get bad service, and I know some places where I know, hey, it's going to be bad service in here, I'm, and I, I may respond and write a negative review. So sometimes um, the absence of some some data is, is good. But if you know people have good experiences, uh, I had such a good time training your uh, employees that I recommended uh, my nephew that he should work at, apply for <laughs> the organization. So I know he did an internship. I don't know what he's going to do in the future, but... But but that's but that's a good story, right? Like like, hey man, this is so impressive. Did I know you'll fit in here? Uh, I trust my family members to be a part of this organization because they'll give you the tools you need to be successful. So, I, I, yeah, that's what we want. That's the best. That's the best success story there, right? Yeah, being recommended. Yeah, yeah. And so, 
I mean, you mentioned a, a little bit about this, but what's some what's the biggest change or improvement that you've seen in these programs? Uh, you know, just employees having the resources they need to improve their careers. Yeah. Um, they're improving their relationships. They're getting support in a way they haven't before. Yeah. Um, they're getting understood in a way they haven't been before. They're be able to understand their colleagues better, just more engaged and excited to work. So yeah. you're just seeing people be more transparent, more open to dialogue, more open to two-way dialogue and giving that feedback, just that amazing dialogue that they're having. You can just kind of almost feel it in the hallways. Yeah. And you want, you, you, that's what you want, right? When people come to work, you want them to be able to work. Uh, yeah. You don't want them having to deal with a whole bunch of problems. You don't want them stressed out and they're going to leave or quit. You want them to stay with you a long time if they are, are good performers. Uh, you don't want them leaving and getting upset and and, and then telling their friends, hey, this is a terrible place to work, uh, especially in the, this tightening job market. Uh, you know, people are a little yeah. bit more discerning when it comes to, to, to working. People have other options. And so, yeah, so I'm glad that, yeah, your people feel like they have the tools that they need and uh, it's building relationships. Those are important pieces as we think about this diversity, equity, inclusion work. And I would say, I mean, we certainly don't have it perfect. Yeah. I do get feedback about, hey, you know, I saw this. I think we need to improve it. But that there is a success story because that wasn't happening five years ago. Okay, People yeah. weren't holding each other accountable for mistakes or improving. They were just kind of still going along. And so um, that, too, has been exciting for people to come to me and say, hey, we need to fight. We need to fix this area. We're finding barriers within the organization and fixing them. Yeah. And, and that's part of the response to the, I think, to generational shift, too. I, I think as we talked a little bit about millennials and, and Gen Z and I have two uh, Gen Z adults, now they're adults, uh, that are getting ready to enter into the work work uh, force. But I, I don't think younger generations tolerate some of the stuff that Gen X or baby boomers tolerated in the workplace. You know, at one point it was just good enough where you get you got your paycheck, that's enough. That's probably not enough nowadays. Uh, people want to have a little bit more say, a little bit more input, and folks aren't staying uh, – I mean, can you imagine you used to stay on a job for like 20 years and then they give you like a pen or like a watch? Hey, I got a, I got a, I got a five dollar watch or whatever it was to die. I, I think they watch. still do that at my company too. So, but yeah, I, that's I, not I what I can buy watch? my own pen and watch. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So, all right. So now we've talked a little bit about your work, uh, but we're going to get into a real important subject here. It's English Bulldogs. <laughs> All right. So you have an English. This has nothing to do with diversity. Equity. Maybe it does. It That's does a, it. A, a breed of dog, right? But an uh, English <laughs> Bulldog, what, what makes that breed of dog unique? Well, I'll, I'll talk about her specifically. So her name is <laughs> Abby, and right. she comes from the line of the Mississippi State mascot Bulldog. So she's, you, she's almost, like royalty. I'm a little bit of a celebrity. Okay. Um, so the current mascot is her uncle and you know they kind of rotate mascots out they let them retire so the mascot before um her uncle was her father and the one before that was her grandfather so what? you know maybe one of these days she, you know she'll be a female mascot for a football team but um to the breed i mean the best way to describe her as a toddler is eat sleep and cause chaos um, she's just all over the place, drooling, snoring, grunting, making all the noises. Okay. Um, she has a very active Instagram. If you guys want to follow okay. her, Abby Nash Lou, but just my favorite and such a fun hobby for me, <laughs> um, to okay. cause chaos with her. So, <laughs> so, so, so we have, a. so she can't be the mascot cause she's a female dog. I, I don't think so. And I looked it up one time, and I think there are a few female mascots, but it's primarily male. So that's oh, the next goodness. d and I entrance is yeah. changing up the mascot game. <laughs> we, we, we have to end this discrimination uh, with the, the mascot. So uh, I think so. Yeah, I don't I want to get so. you in trouble with Mississippi State, but Mississippi State, <laughs> hey, we need to address this. We need to get this right. Yeah, she could <laughs> absolutely be the mascot. <laughs> 
Did you, does it mean does the the dog mom get to go to the games for free if if the dog is a mascot? I think so. I mean, there's a whole handler. They're they're definitely treated like royalty, and this one is as well. So all right, I'm a, I'm going to follow Abby, and uh, we're going we need to get Abby. Uh, we need to get her some respect here. In, uh, she follows your Instagram account, so oh, the, oh, okay. Well, thank yes. <laughs> so so now, do you have any other dogs? I, uh, Abby did recently get a sister. So her name is Phoebe um, and she's a Choweeny. So that's a Chihuahua Dotson mix. Um, okay. And she um, just loves Abby to death and follows her everywhere. And um, yeah, so I've got two now. All right. All right. So you have two dogs now and uh, this is your first adult dog, right? This is your first like yeah. you get some as a kid. Did you have bulldogs as a kid or is this not as a kid? My mom was really into Scotty dogs. Um okay. so yeah, as a kid I we had Scotty dogs growing up, but I wanted the bulldog. <laughs> so so okay, so your dog is uh Mississippi royalty now. So are you like well you're from California though? Like I don't understand this. how did you how did California get to Mississippi dog? What's the it's, it has to be a story there. I'm, I'm really diverse, right? So I live in California. I moved to Alabama. I just popped over the state line and grabbed Abby. So I lived in Alabama for a few years and now I'm in Arizona. I'm just trying out every state I can at this point. Yeah. Yeah. You've been some different places from California to the deep South <laughs> to Arizona, which is, I guess, I don't know. That's kind of retiree town it's like it, a retiree it, state <laughs> yeah 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 it used to yeah uh, my wife used to want to move to uh phoenix I, I think it's too hot but yeah but she's she, she, too hot i'm a little bit higher than that so okay. I'm, I'm not hitting that cactus weather <laughs> okay all right and since we're, we're talking about diversity equity inclusion so now do you hate cat people or do you exclude I, cat people i don't i love cat people i actually had two kitties for 14 years i miss them dearly um, and Abby loved them as well. They did not love her, but um, I'm all about cat people as well. Well, I'm, I'm with Abby. I think cats, you know, I don't know. Cats kind of evil, I think. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have any pets. I'm a, more of a fish tank kind of guy. Um, oh, I can never keep a fish alive. Well, okay. I had a whole bunch of fish. I won't tell you what happened to my fish when I moved, but. Um, oh, no. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe a dog one day. I don't know about cats. Cats, I feel like they have their own thing going on in the house and like, I, I don't know. We'll see. They do. <laughs> yep. All right. So let's just kind of wrap up uh, our discussion today. And again, I just really appreciate you sharing and sharing about how these things have benefited you and your work and your, your organization. And hopefully it's inspirational to some people. I really think you all have a good, uh, good plan. You know, you really identify specific skills that you want people to have and then set a pathway for them to to get those skills and the ongoing training um i think is so important for organizations you can't just kind of set it and forget it you you remember ron papil set it and forget it do you remember those commercials i'm, I'm, I'm aging a different myself. generation yeah i'm sorry i'm aging myself but it was this, uh, <laughs> some people know what it is set it the ronco man ron papil the ronco man he would set it and forget it it was like a roaster it was this rotisserie chicken thing that he made and you i mean i've heard the term set it and forget it but i had no idea it came yeah. from something <laughs> all right yeah it was before we had air fries we had rumpo peel gotcha but uh any surprises from the work that i did with your, your organization and, and the, the training that we did together I, I would say people are still talking about it and i mean i'm not too surprised right okay. but with training you can sometimes forget the details right i've been in training for a long time. And I know I received some training probably 14 years ago. I don't remember anything, um, but our employees are remembering the details like two years later. Oh, so I'm really um, excited that they're really uh, valuing what they learned out of your training. Well, good. I appreciate that. It's, it's, you know, sometimes you wonder, are things being, you know, are you having an impact or, or is your training effective? And, you know, I think it is. And, uh, but I'm glad to hear that and get to get that feedback. And and again, it really helps when the clients know what they want. Like, no, they're really clear about their objectives. And, and I can do some of that work. Um, but it, it really is helpful once the organization knows its identity and then how it wants to merge that with these uh, DE&I concepts. Yeah, we worked on that quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so now you've hired a bunch of trainers and yeah, anything that you can think is missing or, or what do if you were speaking to other trainers, like what would you tell them? What 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 do they need to do to better serve uh, organizations like yours? So I've got two things. Um, the first is interactive. I hmm. think programs that are an experience, that knowledge lasts longer. I still remember when I was in, you know, elementary school and high school, they did really cool programs where, you know, one day it was kind of a settler's day and they held classes with the lights out and we had to wear oh. period clothing. We wrote okay. on chalkboards. I mean, I remember that as if it was yesterday. Um, and in high school we did, you know, Renaissance fairs. So those, oh. are, those are just part of my memory. And, and at high school, I hate to say it, is well past 20 years ago, right? Oh, wow. So I've not forgotten those experiences. And anywhere where we can change training to be an experience that's mm -hmm. not forgotten um, is really going to be a lasting impact. Um, and I think the second piece, and it's really related to that lasting in, impact, is that long-term follow-up. So reaching out to participants 90 days after, what have they implemented in the three months since the training? What are they struggling with? Just that built-in accountability. Um, mm -hmm. But that's also really instant feedback for the trainer, right? They can yeah. then say, look, I did my course and three months later, a follow-up is telling me that they have implemented X, Y, Z. So I can tell you that 30 days or 90 days after a course, people are still using it. Um, so, it, you know, that is a win-win, getting that accountability and that participant reminder, but then the trainer's getting some good feedback about their their work and is able to use that as well. Wow, hey, I, I mean, that's a great idea, Megan. I, I really like that. I'm going to have to send uh, Abby a dog biscuit or something to thank you for that. That's a, that's a good tip. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add that to my uh, follow-up with clients, though, so that 90 days. I mean, I really, because I asked a question, and sometimes you don't, you don't, you lose... Uh, touch with clients if they aren't um, kind of just kind of doing a one-off thing. So yeah, I like I like that. I, I think I'm gonna add that. And well, so how do you know if a if a DEI instructor is a, a good fit or going to be a good fit? Yeah, um, it's a company's existing culture and then their leadership buy-in. Mm -hmm. So if most companies, you know, I've said it already a few times, they have values, right? But are they showing up in the workplace or yeah. are they just a poster on the wall? Is okay. it woven throughout the culture? Yeah. Um, you know, we had DE and I as a focus, but now it's almost, you know, I would say it's more of a priority. Um, but our leadership is showing up. They mm -hmm. aren't just talking about it. They're showing their actions. They've mm -hmm. put their weight behind it. And okay. I think that's the difference. I wouldn't do DE and I for every organization. I'll only do it for the organizations where um, the approach matters oh, right yeah. they want it they want to have a good approach and leadership really truly is showing up as a visible um yeah uh, just a visible person in de and i yeah so i yeah so yeah just make sure people understood the question is yeah so like if you are serving as de and i role how do you know if it's going to be a good fit so i, I like what you you said that yeah, are people really buying in? Because some companies don't. I mean, they're just doing it to ch to, to check a box. Yeah. But is it really woven into the culture? I think that's important. And and maybe you know people that are listening to this are struggling with uh, with that. I know all organizations aren't really supportive. You know, how do you get the big bosses to buy into it? And, and I think all your senior VPs came to uh, came through the training, so yeah. uh, it needs to work at all levels. I, I don't think it can be a bottom up thing. I, I think it actually has to kind of flow down from the from the top and uh, yeah. never get people access. So uh, I think that's really an important aspect of this. Well, anything else that you want to you want to share uh, before we we close out? I've had a great time today. I always love working with you. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. Well, you are quite well. I should actually I should tell this story. You mentioned your fourth. I should tell this. Four, it's not my fourth grade story. It's like my son's story. Like he was at a school. <laughs> at a school where they had a, it was like a Thanksgiving thing. And so they had this, um, this thing where they would dress up kind of like, uh, as the pilgrims and the, mm -hmm. and like in the Indians and like, they had like one Indian person and they would have the kids dress up and chase the Indian person through the woods. Oh. I'm like, uh, they asked me, about, <laughs> they asked 
asked me if I wanted to be. Well, maybe different than what they should have done. <laughs> yeah, they asked yeah. me if I, if I wanted to be the person. I said, uh, I don't think that'll be a good idea. I think <laughs> I'll pass on that role. So, but I remember <laughs> it, right? I, I remember it. Yeah, uh, you remember it, but what was the impact and is it positive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it gave my son and I something to talk about, though. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so it was a learning opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. But thank you so much, Megan. And I thank you for the feedback. And I know that my listeners will glean some some valuable insight from this. Uh, But thank you all so much for for joining me. I'm Glenn Guyton, your cultural competency navigator. Uh, If you need any assistance with your diversity, equity, inclusion goals in the workplace, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining me in this community. You all have a great day.